Good morning, everyone. We have a lot to go over this morning, and then my team will go into more detail shortly, so I'll keep my comments brief. To start, I want to update you on our weekly evaluation uh, on school and recreational sports. Unfortunately, we're still not in a position to announce restarting these programs today, but we're continuing to reevaluate that decision based on the data, and we'll revisit this uh, issue next week. As well uh, as our usual health and education updates on Fridays, today we have announcements on our surveillance testing program, contact tracing, in our medical reserve corps to make sure our long-term long care facilities are staffed. Director Borman will also talk about VT Alerts, which is our emergency alert system, which will now offer COVID updates. So uh, anyone looking to stay on top of the latest COVID news in Vermont can now do so through VT Alerts. But before the others go into details, I want to reflect on two pieces of news. First, the FDA advisory panel recommended approval of Pfizer's COVID vaccine for emergency use yesterday. It's expected the FDA will make that official within the next couple of days. And while this is uh, certainly an incredible news and an important milestone, as well as a huge step toward defeating this virus, uh, which has uh, devastated our way of life, uh, we have to reflect on what's going on right now. As we've said here before, we have a team of talented experts in Vermont who have been working for months to prepare for the distribution of the vaccine. To be sure, this has and will be complicated, but we're ready and we expect if the FDA and CDC sign off, the first doses will arrive sometime next week. And while this is great news and should give us all hope, we're not out of the woods yet. We'll, uh, we'll be, uh, again, looking at this uh, every day and dealing with this uh, with a limited number of supplies. Now, every, uh, every single morning since March, I start my day looking at how the Northeast states are doing, as well as Florida, Texas, and California. And I write down the number of positives and the number of deaths each state had the day before. I do this as a daily reminder to myself how quickly things can change. And the fact is, there hasn't been much good news lately. We still have high case counts, which means more have to be admitted to the hospital. And sadly, this results in more deaths. The last statistic has been concerning me more and more. We as a country had more deaths in a single day yesterday uh, than we lost on 9-11. Now think about that for a moment. Over 3,000 deaths in one day. And we're about to go over 300,000 deaths since March. That's more deaths than we lost in World War I, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan combined. Every death is tragic, regardless of the circumstances or age. And we know it's not just older folks in nursing homes who are at risk. Right across the border in New Hampshire, they're dealing with an outbreak among mem members of their legislature. And tragically, a 71-year-old Speaker of the House lost his short battle with COVID on Wednesday. He was just sworn in last week. It's just a reminder that this virus doesn't care who you are or what title you hold. This is tough stuff, but COVID isn't compassionate and isn't afraid to prove the dire and very real consequences each and every day. So while it's important to acknowledge the good news around the vaccine, we've got to put it into context. And remember, the virus is still our common enemy. Because while it's a step in the right direction, until enough people are vaccinated, it's critical we keep doing what we've been doing. So I ask you again to continue wearing a mask, avoid crowds and gatherings, and quarantine when you need to. Together, we can keep each other safe as we work our way towards the end of the tunnel. So with that, I'll now turn it over to Deputy Secretary Boucher, who has an update on our career technical centers 
and how they're managing with COVID. Thank you, Governor. Good morning. As Governor Scott said, I'll provide an update today framed largely around our Career Technical Education or CTE system in Vermont. We have 16 different CTE centers around the state and I'll highlight the work they've been doing to ensure that our students who are enrolled in programs like pre-engineering, culinary arts, construction sciences, medical sciences, advanced manufacturing, graphic design, and automotive technology, to name just a few, are effectively accessing their education. CTE programs are generally much more hands-on and applied than the traditional education classroom. Accordingly, our CTE leaders and educators have had to pivot uniquely to create instructional paradigms and flexible offerings in order to meet student need in the context of the pandemic. Luckily, this is a group of educators and leaders who are used to thinking outside the box. I'm pleased to report that our CTE system is doing quite well in its handling of and response to COVID-19. The majority of CTE centers like schools are operating within a hybrid teaching and learning paradigm with students learning through a blend of both in-person and remote learning. Teachers and staff are doing outstanding work. Instructors have worked diligently to learn Canvas or other online platforms and to move their curriculum into these systems. As one center director wrote in an email last week, teachers have adapted and improved their assessment systems and skills, can change their instructional model on the fly, and support one another mentally and emotionally, the latter being needed almost on a daily basis, which is something that we've talked about quite a bit um, throughout the pandemic and also recently. Another CTE director wrote last week to say, while our teachers are challenged in new ways every day, they continue to be committed to student learning and well-being. They are indomitable. Across the board, CT directors report that students are adhering to the rules of mask wearing, hand washing, and social distancing without complaint. The recurring theme is that they are simply grateful to be able to be at the CTE center. In addition, families have been understanding, supportive, and grateful for in-person learning for their children. To be sure, people are tired. CTE directors are exhausted, as are their staff. Despite that, most continue to do outstanding work, and I'd like to publicly thank them for their commitment and efforts to ensure that CTE students can continue their education as seamlessly as possible during these challenging times. Now I'll turn to an update on the Governor's Emergency Education Relief, or GEAR, funds. As you may recall, GEAR funds were part of the overall Federal CARES Act. In Vermont, Governor Scott wanted to ensure that these funds of over $4.4 million for our state were used to bolster the CTE system during the pandemic. Given the Governor's close ties to CTE as a former CTE educator himself, as well as the centrality of robust CTE programs for our economic health and recovery as a state, it made sense to infuse our CTE system with these resources. I'm pleased to report that we have now allocated 100% of Vermont's GEAR funds. All 16 of our CTE centers applied for these resources, and this is exciting news because we all, both the AOE and the field, had to turn this grant program set up and the application process around very quickly. So we're very thrilled that we will indeed use all of these funds in the way Governor Scott had hoped. So what are CTE centers doing with these funds? I'll show a couple of slides to illustrate, and the first one is already up there. So as you can see on this first slide, the bulk of the funds are being used for both equipment and supplies. And this is not surprising given the applied nature of these programs that I alluded to earlier. Many of our centers have had to make provisions so that students would no longer need to share necessary toolkits, software, and course materials. In addition, the advanced software required for many CTE programs required the purchase of new laptops and iPads for students because these programs can't run on Chromebooks or the existing base level laptops typically used for general education purposes. Prior to COVID, students accessed these technology um, paradigms on desktop computers in uh, program labs, which um, is not a feasible solution um, during the pandemic because of our social distancing needs. CTE centers are also investing in upgraded teaching technology, so teachers can live stream demonstrations to those students who cannot be in person on any given day. 
Funds are being used to upgrade broadband internet access at school and providing internet access to students who would not otherwise have access at home. And simulated labs, dissection kits, and mannequins are needed to replace in-person clinical training and work-based learning in many programs. We can also see on this chart that over 17% of the funds are being used for additional staffing. Hiring more instructional aides, for instance, so half of students can be in the shop or the lab with the teacher, while the other half work on content in a separate space, again, in order to comply with our required social distancing as we manage the pandemic. Um, CTE centers are also investing in expanded guidance and nursing staff and full-time substitutes. From the second slide, we can see that the most specific um, activities under these funding sources are, support, are focused on instruction and instruction-related technology, and that's consistent with what I just noted. I also wanted to take a moment to highlight the creativity of CTE centers and how they're responding to the pandemic. One center received federal approval to purchase a used van with the funds so that they would have sufficient flexibility to transport students to and from the center. Again, in the context of not knowing whether the schedule might need to change with little warning due to community virus level. Um, and so this flexibility for this center was needed because scheduling a busing service wasn't really meeting the needs of students. They needed to have something much more flexible and, and, and able to go. Um, and we did get approval for that from, from the feds. Um, they, were, they were excited to hear about this, actually. Um, another center will use funds to convert their greenhouse and their storage shed into new classroom spaces in order to meet the social distancing requirements required to preserve student and uh, staff health. Finally, Burlington Technical Center should be commended for the fact that they have found new physical locations for all of their CTE programs. Within six weeks of the campus closing, all programs were up and running in new spaces throughout the community. Again, this goes to show how dedicated and committed our CTE, ed CTE educators are throughout the state. That concludes my update, and I'll now turn it over to Director Borneman. Good morning. I'm Erica Borneman. I'm the Director of Vermont Emergency Management, and I am pleased to be here this morning to discuss the utilization of the Vermont Alert System to enhance the dissemination of timely and relevant information of protective actions related to the ongoing pandemic. Vermont Alert is a trusted resource to warn Vermonters of potential and imminent hazards like floods, severe storms, hazardous materials, incidents, and other threats to themselves or uh, their property. The system will now be used to keep Vermonters informed about the, uh, about the pandemic and is an important resource for people to get the most up-to-date and accurate information about COVID-19. As case counts grow, as individuals are being asked to do more and more to keep their neighbors safe, and as we draw nearer to a vaccine, we feel every Vermonter can benefit from this important informational source. There is a lot of good information available, and Vermont Alert will not take the place of COVID-19 uh, information pages like healthvermont.gov, accd.vermont.gov, and vem.vermont.gov, among others. We will direct you to these and other resources so that you can be pointed to the most uh, important updates directly from state sources. But I, and I encourage you to check them regularly. I should note, Vermonters will get good news from, through Vermont Alert. As restrictions are eventually lifted, as recreational and school sports eventually resume, and as vaccination clinics eventually you, uh, open, uh, users will be notified directly if they are signed up. Vermont Alert is an opt-in service. You have to sign up and get most alerts, and I encourage, I encourage everyone in Vermont to do so. We currently have about 25,000 subscribers, and we would love to have more. To register, go to vermontalertvtalert.gov and register for a free account. Once there, you can choose which alerts you receive, and COVID information is under the Health Alerts tab. If you are a current subscriber, you can go to the same site, log in, and change your notifications. 
You can also decide how you want to be notified of those alerts, email, text, phone, or notifications on our app, uh, if you search for the Everbridge app under the App Store. And for what specific area you want to re receive alerts for using your hometown and county. You can accomplish this all on your smartphone phone, through the Everbridge app or online at vtalert.gov. We know there's a lot of information we all need to know to keep our families and our communities safe. Vermont Alert will help you know how you can do that and when the data supports it. And will provide timely notice of when and where to get vaccinated. And importantly, when we can once again turn, return to activities, gatherings, and events that make up the quality of life we treasure so much in Vermont. Again, that alert, that address is vtalert.gov. And with that, I will hand it over to Secretary Smith. Thank you, Erica. I want to take a few moments and talk about three initiatives that I've mentioned previously, but today I wish to address them in more detail. Last week I had mentioned that long-term care facilities, especially skilled nursing facilities where the most vulnerable Vermonters may reside, are challenged by outbreaks in their facilities, especially uh, during the first 24 to 48 hours of an outbreak when staff may test positive and have to isolate and other staff who are close contacts to the positive must quarantine. It is also challenging in these facilities when residents are near death and require additional staff attention. This situation produces a scramble to provide adequate staffing either through heroic efforts of existing staff or equally heroic efforts of volunteers or temporary staff or through institutions like UVMMC or Home Health, which have been great partners in this effort, or all of the above. But we need to do more. The state of Vermont uh, has contracted with TLC Home Care, a staffing agency based out of Williston, for emergency long-term care facility staffing needs. This is a professional staffing pool and represents new capacity within our system. It will augment our existing Medical Reserve Corps and serve Vermont volunteer pools. TLC has been an excellent resource for many Vermont facilities in supporting staffing needs throughout the pandemic, and we're confident they will hit the ground running with expanded capacity to meet the increasing need. TLC is a Vermont-owned company uh, operated by nurses who care about fellow Vermonters. TLC will provide the for emergency staffing deployment of up to 40 staff, 40 staff total. Those are RNs, LPNs, LNAs, and unlicensed caregivers and support staff specific to long-term care and COVID outbreak response needs. The contract will be managed by Dale, the Department of Aging and Independent Living, as part of the Health Outbreak Prevention and Response Team. That is a rapid response team that's been, that's been organized since uh, the start of the pandemic. The contract has flexibility to pivot to different needs. However, the primary focus is providing staffing to long-term uh, care facility outbreaks. This is a solution meant to augment uh, staffing shortfalls, which arise in long-term care facilities, particularly, as I said before, when an outbreak situation is identified and staffing is impacted by the virus. It is a short-term and not intended to solve all staffing concerns, yet will meet critical needs to bridge gaps for COVID-19 outbreak situations. In addition, Dale has created a website, covidstaffing.vermont.gov, it's a call to action for Vermonters who have capacity to step up and help meet the critical needs of COVID-19 responses in long-term care facilities. Clinicians with capability to step in are especially needed in either paid or volunteer roles. We are in this together, so we are requesting Vermonters to assist in our healthcare, to assist our healthcare heroes uh, during this surge. The need is great for clinicians and support staff. 
Just to be clear, the intent is not to shift existing healthcare workforce into this pool, but rather to a call out for those that have additional capacity, part-time workers, retirees, unemployment, uh, unemployed individuals, college students, to step up and fill short-term gaps in the system caused by COVID-19 outbreaks. I want to take a few minutes. Um, I also want to say this. I just, I can't leave this subject without thanking the long-term care facility workforce enough for their dedication and skill in caring for the most vulnerable Vermonters in the most unimaginable of circumstances. They need help and we need to help them and help is on the way. Now let me uh, turn to testing. Besides the establishment of greater capacity in our testing statewide, including new sites that will be up and running uh, next week in Richford and uh, Swanton, as well as Wells River, I wanted to talk about um, more capacity on bringing, that we're bringing on for surveillance testing. Last week, we performed 30, uh, 34,500, last seven days, we performed 34,541 tests. And we're adding to that capacity because still, we are seeing too many days of, uh, of over 100 COVID-19 cases. So we must do everything that we possibly can to get a handle on the virus and put more safety measures into place. One way to improve is what we know about the spread of the virus and to address the elevated risk is for more people to be tested. To that end, we're requiring 25% of patient-facing healthcare providers and staff to be tested monthly. As we all appreciate, our healthcare workforce is essential and critical regardless of COVID-19 and even more so during this pandemic. There is no question that healthcare providers and staff can safely deliver care and services in healthcare settings and can prevent the transmission of COVID-19. Personal protection equipment, along with recommended safety precautions, make healthcare settings safe for patients, providers, and staff. However, this is a very large workforce that is also circulating in the community where transmission can more easily take place. So in order to accomplish our goal of more surveillance um, and to protect this workforce, AHS and the Department of Health have worked to increase testing capacity both by working directly with healthcare providers and through on-demand testing sites. The teams will continue their work to identify and implement the fastest and most efficient testing options available to minimize the burden on the system. And again, I want to take some time to thank the heroic healthcare providers and staff who are on the front lines providing high quality compassionate care and support for the people of our state. In addition, uh, starting next week, we are augmenting the approximately 105 full-time equivalent contact tracers we have with a new call center. The call center will be put in place using Maximus staff. Maximus is the current contractor charged with administering the Vermont Health Connect program in terms of having a call center. The Maximus team will begin early next week and will bolster contact tracing efforts by midweek. The initial rollout will include 25 agents, but two more waves of 25 people will be added for a total of 75 additional uh, contact tracers. The expanded team will be working 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. daily, seven days a week, including holidays, until we decide they are no longer necessary. Maximus has experience in this work, including statewide tracing efforts in other states. And just one other item, I just wanted, why I'm up here, take the opportunity to say that this is the last week of open enrollment the yearly period for individuals to sign up for health insurance coverage. Uh, that coverage uh, through the Vermont, Vermont Health Connect. Enrollment opened on November 1st and ends next Tuesday, uh, December 15th. 
The customer service support hours are extended for the final days of open enrollment to provide personalized assistance for Vermonters. It's important to remember that if you try to get through and aren't able to complete the process by the deadline, we will still be able to help you throughout next week. The COVID-19 public health emergency has shown that having health insurance is, is as important as ever. The state of Vermont is committed to ensuring that Vermonters have access to health coverage and those that qualify for, net, for, for not financial help will get it uh, paid, help paying for it. Vermonters can apply for health coverage online at vermonthealthconnect.gov and by supportive enrollment uh, assistance offered by telephone and the number is 1-855-899 nine six zero zero and through regional based assisters uh, the state also offers a plan comparison tool so vermonters can get quick anonymous estimates for financial help and learn about available health care plans i'll now turn that's that's the conclusion of my update i'll now turn it over to dr levine who will provide his weekly update uh, as well thank you very much As you can see, <clears throat> we're now over 5,500 total cases since the pandemic began and 93 deaths. We're reporting uh, today on our website 113 new cases and um, we'll be also showing 26 hospitalizations, two patients in the ICU no patients on ventilators. So we've seen a lot in the national news and gotten questions here about the potential impact of Thanksgiving on cases. It's now been about two weeks since Thanksgiving. You can see on this slide the time period where we would begin to see any impact starting at around seven days after the holiday. This gives the 7 to 14 day span. We did have that highest case day ever, which was clearly not all related to Thanksgiving by any means. It uh, had a lot to do with uh, reporting and uh, issues, as you recall, with the UVM Medical Center's reporting and other late reports that came in. We have been pretty much in a stable pattern over these number of days. There still may be people who became symptomatic uh, late in their course, maybe days 11 to 14, who may be just getting tested and starting now. But I wouldn't anticipate a huge increase in cases uh, at this point in time. Just to bring you up to date, you heard from the Secretary about almost an average of 5,000 tests per day over seven days. I remind everyone again that that's since the college students left campus. So uh, not inflated by college student numbers. And um, I feel comfortable with this number in the low 2% in terms of being an accurate representation of what's going on in Vermont now. Obviously, um, if you only looked at people who are symptomatic, in getting tested for that reason, their number would be much, much higher. Um, this number takes into account asymptomatic people um, and takes into account the fact that we're doing a lot of, as you heard, surveillance testing so we can get a good handle on the state of virus prevalence in, in, in our state. We're not seeing a lot in the terms of syndromic surveillance changing in this most recent period. Uh, which means that uh, even though flu has been reported as sporadic and COVID is reported as we've just reported, we're not seeing a lot of increase in uh, people presenting to urgent care settings with symptoms. Now, um, while our cases remain higher than, they, than we are used to seeing, they've remained fairly stable lately, and there's been no escalating spike, as you could see on the data. 
We hope this means that Vermonters either avoided Thanksgiving gatherings or kept them very small. And we truly appreciate that. None of our recent contact tracing efforts have revealed clusters of cases coming from this holiday. But we are still seeing about 100 to 120 cases a day, which is a level much higher than we are accustomed to. As of yesterday, the EPI teams were in, uh, continuing to investigate and follow 38 outbreaks and somewhat north of 220 situations. We're not seeing a so-called surge on a surge, as a number of places in the country have seen, and we've not seen new escalations in our level or percent positivity, as our neighbors in even this region have been seeing uh, extensively. But I caution us that these are not numbers we should start to develop a new comfort level with. As I spoke about on Tuesday, numbers like this can have significant impacts especially when viewed through the lens of our three priorities of keeping our kids in in-person instruction in school, keeping our workers at workplaces and our economy thriving, and reducing illnesses, hospitalizations, or deaths. All of these cases that we report daily continue to impact our schools, our work sites, our healthcare facilities. And unfortunately, the number of new cases in both residents and staff of long-term care facilities continue to rise. The total on this slide is a little over 300. Again, they vary by the site. We are also, as of today, going to be adding two new sites with very small numbers of cases thus yet, Holiday House Residential Care Home and Our Lady of Providence Residential Care Community. There are simply more people with COVID-19 in our communities right now and more potential for possible exposure. We need to take that into account as we plan for and celebrate holidays. As the CDC and our current guidance says, staying home is still the best way to protect ourselves, our families, and others right now. And speaking of protecting one another, the CDC recently released a summary of public health strategies to address high levels of community transmission of COVID-19 in the December 4th Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. It acknowledges the effect of colder weather, more time spent indoors, the holiday season, and silent spread of disease leading to where we all are in this country right now. It highlights the importance of a multi-pronged approach using evidence-based strategies to reduce transmission and provide a bridge to a time when we can safely return to everyday activities. The report came out now because of the frankly alarming statistics we're confronted with every single day regarding our nation's experience with the virus and the hopes that states can implement the combination of strategies and reduce the transmission of SARS-CoV-2 virus, long-term sequela of disability, hospitalizations, and death, as well as mitigate the economic impact. Now, the things I'm going to present right now won't surprise you because they are strategies that Vermont has already embraced for many, many months. But I think it's important for all Vermonters to hear them one by one and understand that we've already placed a check mark in the box beside each one. So they include universal face mask use, for which there is compelling evidence, especially in light of the large amount of asymptomatic transmission of virus. Maintaining physical distance from others and limiting in-person contact, for much the same reasons I just recited. Avoiding non-essential indoor spaces and crowded outdoor spaces. You've heard us for a long time speaking about the reasons why we should both avoid crowds as well as multi-household gatherings, and our data does support our recommendations. Fourthly, increasing testing to quickly identify and isolate people who are infected. Again, especially as a means to halt silent transmission of disease. And as you know, and as you heard even more today, Vermont has, has been and continues to be a leader 
in the volume of testing and the access to testing. Fifth, promptly identifying, quarantining, and testing close contacts. This is, in essence, what we've been calling our containment strategy, and I think you've heard us talk enough about that to appreciate that it's going on here. And it's helped keep our kids in school, our students on campus, and our businesses open when cases arise. Safeguarding people most at risk for severe illness or death from infection. You often heard us talk about our most vulnerable and our policies that seek to protect them, especially those who live in congregate settings, and allowed us to learn to work productively with racial and ethnic minority groups who also have increased risk. Protecting essential workers with adequate PPE and safe work practices. We have stockpiled PPE quite effectively in Vermont, and we do have sector-specific guidance to protect frontline workers. Postponing travel, I think recognition of this source of virus transmission has determined travel policy from the very earliest days of the pandemic in our state. Increasing ventilation and enhancing hand hygiene and environmental disinfection. All of this uh, guidance that we gave to businesses and to the education sector about reopening was filled with detail about this element, even though, frankly, the minority of infections occur through touching surfaces. And lastly, Achieving widespread availability and high community coverage with effective COVID-19 vaccines, a journey we are about to launch together uh, as a state. And you heard from the governor about the advisory panel to the FDA. The FDA, perhaps as we're speaking here today, but uh, sometime today will come out with their official uh, recommendation for emergency use authorization of the Pfizer platform. Over the weekend, the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices of the CDC will inform the CDC, who I expect on Monday will come out with their recommendations, which is really critical for the entire practice healthcare community. And then we will move from there. The report also notes that we need to make sure all of our strategies take health equity into account to safeguard those who have borne the worst of the pandemic's impact. People who most are at risk due to high age or underlying medical conditions and racial and ethnic minorities. So although in Vermont we are not immune to the increased COVID-19 transmission happening everywhere under our eyes, we have much still to do. Based on this important CDC report, we are doing the right things. And while that can make us feel more comfortable, we can still say that not a day has gone by where we didn't learn something new, where we were open to refining our approach even further. We continue to work together, whether it's schools, businesses, healthcare providers, policymakers, communities, and more, and of course, individual Vermonters. We all play a role in making these strategies a reality. I'm proud of our entire team's work so far, and I look forward to that final goal of achieving high community coverage with effective vaccine. <clears throat> My final few comments have to do with the announcement I made earlier in the week regarding our test notification system for close contacts. And it's mainly to announce that that actually did begin on yes uh, yesterday. The texts are for certain people who've been identified as close contacts by someone who has COVID-19. This helps us get information out to them very quickly so close contacts can then quarantine right away and access other important information on our website. Keep in mind, these texts do not replace an actual person and expert contact tracing work that will occur. Everyone identified as a close contact still gets a phone call from a contact tracer. And I must note that unfortunately the number that appears on your phone that I mentioned on Tuesday was a test number. The actual correct number that the text will be coming from is 89361. 89361. This number is also listed on our website. As a reminder, our contact tracing team will help determine who gets these texts 
based on the situation. If you should get a text, know that it is a legitimate and important message from the Department of Health. I'll turn this back to the governor now. Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll now open it up to questions. All right, just as a reminder, I notified all the reporters ahead of time. It's 1146 and we have 27 reporters in the queue. So we are gonna limit this to two questions and then uh, move on from, from there. We'll start in the room with Calvin. Um, thank you. So probably for Dr. Levine, I would say, um, you know, we've, we've had some pretty robust discussion about whether the state can mandate vaccines, but what about employers? Can individual employers uh, mandate vaccines for their, um, their workers? We have a read your quote. Oh, cool. <clears throat> Thanks for the question. So at the moment, there is actually not an approved vaccine. There's a vaccine that's being recommended for emergency use authorization. And this comes from the commissioner of the FDA, Stephen Hahn. Institutions may require individuals to take an FDA approved vaccine or apply for an exception. However, emergency use authorization products are still considered investigational. So the implication there is you cannot mandate a vaccine that has only received EUA approved decision. It has to have official FDA approval. So it's a moot point really to answer the question you asked. Makes sense. And then I guess one follow-up question probably for Secretary Smith as well. Um, these uh, TLC, um, Excuse me, yeah, uh, the TLC workers and the volunteer pool that we're going to be calling on, are they going to be assigned to just one facility or, or do you envision them maybe traveling around to where they're needed? Because I just, uh, there could potentially be a risk for, for spread there, as you may know. Yeah, it, you know, obviously we have daily testing right now in, in our, our skilled nursing facilities and twice a week testing in other facilities for long-term care. So there's abundant testing going on among staff. The, the, these are with staff we're talking about. And then, of course, if there is a positive, then we start facility-wide testing over multiple days as well. So they would be placed where needed. Uh, throughout uh, throughout the state, you know, when we have multiple outbreaks, uh, we have these situations in multiple places, and that's and that's where they would be placed. Steve, uh, given that um, the the uh, emergency order from uh, the CDC will uh, be coming down today, uh, or from the FDA. How soon do we expect to uh, fire up the uh, the injections for for our first first wave? Do we know? Yeah. Well, again, uh, Dr. Levine can answer the question in but more the detail. Plan, but yeah. uh, we're still waiting uh, for the FDA uh, final approval. The CDC has to sign off as well, and then they have to be shipped to us. So, and then we can distribute from there. So we're not talking about instantaneous. Uh, it won't be early next week. It really all depends on when we receive uh, the, the vaccine, uh, and then we can distribute from there. But we're we've been working on this for a while, and we're prepared and ready ready to go just as soon as we receive them. And just ten seconds to add to that. Yep. Um, so FDA, CDC, shipment, um, sometime middle to late next week, but. These are federal dates being told to us, and they change, so I don't want it to be held to those dates. Okay. Um, and then ability to deploy them from the depot to the various hospitals around the state. The long-term care facilities, because they are in a partnership, the federal government and the pharmacies uh, will be receiving shipments, and the hope is that by the 21st, which is not too far away, they can get their first doses. The pharmacies have been contracted to provide three separate uh, clinics over a three-week period as more and more vaccine comes in on a weekly basis. So we hope that over that three-week period, a 
big chunk of the long-term care residents and staff can be handled in the clinics they're providing on site to deliver the vaccine. That's, that was my follow-up question is um, uh, the personnel who are going to be involved in giving those shots, is, is that going to be contracted or is it healthcare work, uh, you know, the hospitals or? Yeah, so for the, pharma for, for the long-term care, it's the pharmacies uh, under a federal contract. Um, and they're committed to these clinics based on their contract. For the healthcare workers around the states, it's us working in close con uh, connection with the healthcare sector and the hospitals specifically. So they'll be giving pretty much themselves the, yes. the vaccine. Okay. Thank you. Moving to the phones, Joe Barton Chronicle. Hello, this is another question about uh, the vaccine. Um, given that it's uh, emergency approval and you said that that would be investigative in nature, um, is there going to be, um, are, there, are there going to be records kept of the patients who receive this and whether or not they come ill later? Uh, I mean, is this part of a uh, non-double-blinded uh, study in effect? Um, we'd we'll be definitely keeping track of these. The federal government is very interested in the, in the data as well um, because we're going to have so, so many different platforms with different uh, vaccines as well. It's going to be imperative uh, that we collect the data. So uh, this will be data about individuals or is it going to be um, just overall data? So there's an extensive um, process because what you're really referring to is uh, making sure we can keep track of any adverse effects, correct? Uh, um, see that people were helped and not harmed and if they were, are the harms reported and kept track of so that we know exactly what kind of events are occurring? Is that the intent of your question? That, that's one side of it. The other side is um, if someone receives the vaccine and the amount uh, of time that passes uh, during which you'd expect um, some form of immunity to be seen, if people have, uh, you know, get the disease, um, I would assume that would be useful information as well. Yes, so, so from the safety side, there's voluntary reporting by individuals who get the vaccine. There's mandatory reporting by the healthcare system and all of the providers. There's monthly safety analyses and reports by the sponsor of the vaccine. And then there's an entire VAER's uh, adverse event reporting system, which uh, takes all this data and works between the FDA and the CDC to understand and share the data so that analyses can be done real time during the period of administration of vaccine and thereafter, making sure that people are aware that not every event occurs in the context of the trials, so you need to be able to robustly report everything that occurs once it's actually in use. Now, there'll be a very significant tracking system in place knowing who got the vaccine, which vaccine they got, because we do anticipate there'll be more than one, what doses they got so that they only get a second dose of the appropriate vaccine that they got the first dose of. Um, and and um, really, I mean, that's the kind of data tracking that will be going on. I, did I get uh, all the angles you were looking for? I, I think so. I probably didn't think of all the ones I should have thought of, but we got ones that I did think of. Thank okay. You. All right, Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Uh, good morning, Governor. I get this question uh, quite a bit. Well, actually, I'm getting it uh, quite a bit. 
also when it goes in different forms and it goes something like this uh, restaurants and bars events and even high school sports uh, who are following the rules uh, that you laid down and ordered are being punished and punished is the word they use uh, governor uh, for basically the bad behavior of individuals who are not following gathering uh, guidelines and that and that sort of thing and, and I'm wondering and that, then they follow up and say, why isn't there enforcement and repercussions for these individuals? Uh, you've spoken about this uh, before, but now we're seeing cases go up. We're seeing deaths go up every day, one, two, three deaths every day here in Vermont. Um, what is your response to that, uh, to those questions, that, that sort of line of questions? Yeah, well, again, it's not... Uh we don't look at it as a punishment, it's just a reality. Uh, when we see the community spread, when we see the social gatherings, and we see areas that uh, uh, give us uh, more of the virus uh, amongst the communities, uh, we have to take action. And uh, to, to close down uh, the opportunities for that social engagement, um, we thought the best approach, uh, the most immediate approach, was to stop uh, the recreation, so to speak, and uh, in other uh, areas. It's, it's really the, the, the best tool we had at the time. Uh, we'd like to be more surgical. We'd like to be more strategic. Um, but uh, we're right in the middle of a, of a, a crisis, a pandemic, uh, each and every day. So we have to, again, do what we think is best to accommodate that. We've been quite successful from the beginning uh, without the enforcement mechanism. Uh, Vermonters have been very compliant. And for the most part, and uh, and certainly we're not seeing everyone on board, uh, but I think uh, I would put Vermont up against almost any other state in that regard. So uh, the enforcement piece might not have the the benefits that some would would hope for, and uh, we would uh, utilize a lot of time and resources in following those up. Um, so we thought uh, we still feel the guidance is the best approach. Uh, but we have been willing when when there have been cases the attorney general has has uh, moved forward with a couple of cases i believe one in particular that i remember um, that being the the gym in rutland and uh, we followed through so uh, again for the most part um, it's due to not understanding what the policy is and and uh, feeling that they uh, don't have to follow the guidance as as we laid out uh, but when we when we educate um, we find that there is compliance. So, so again, uh, I wouldn't look at it as uh, punishment. Uh, it's just the reality at this point. And you know that California recently uh, issued uh, some you know, tickets, basically, to people who are who are gathering. Is, is would that be something that if it got to you know would would be the point where uh, uh, you might in Vermont do that? Well, again, we're seeing uh, a lot of compliance here. Our numbers are flattening out. Uh, we're seeing in California, uh, their, their numbers are growing dramatically. And New York uh, did the same thing. Uh, they had a, a penalty process, uh, and their numbers are growing at this point. Every state is different, and, uh, and I'm not second guessing what they're doing, and, and we just have to do what we think is right here in Vermont. So as long as we continue to see the numbers, uh, we, we continue to have the desired effect, and, and what we did what Vermonters did uh, over Thanksgiving appears to be paying off uh, because it seemed as though it seems as though we're not seeing that surge on the surge. So if that is the case, uh, then Vermonters are doing what they what they can uh, without uh, that uh, that that type of uh, uh, enforcement mechanism that uh, that I don't think is that beneficial. So again, we're, we're going to continue to do. Uh, what we've done since the beginning because it is having the desired effect. The vaccine is coming into place. Hopefully all of this will get us through uh, the, uh, the next few weeks and then we'll be on the road to recovery at that point. All right, thanks, Governor. We're going to move to Chris at the Newport Daily Express. Yes, good morning. With the vaccine in sight, do you see people are forgetting, for lack of a better word, not to get the other seasonal vaccines that says the flu vaccination and uh, even the shingles vaccination. Um, do you have any data on that? I, I believe that uh, Commissioner Pichek has shown that uh, our vaccination rates are actually up uh, for the flu. Uh, so that's good news. I don't know about uh, the shingles or shingrits uh, vaccine at this point. Uh, Dr. Levine could probably comment. 
Yeah, we're, we're really proud of Vermonters. I mean, the, the rallying to the cause for the flu vaccine has been wonderful. We still have room to, to move, so thanks for allowing me to remind everybody of that. Um, shingles vaccine um, is not a seasonal vaccine, uh, and most of the other vaccines are not seasonal in the sense that flu is. So one can get them at the appropriate time in their development in terms of age, etc., uh, whenever. Um, one thing we have noticed um, is that people are availing themselves of health care. Obviously, back in March, April, May, people were very afraid to even go near the health care system, not realizing, as we have come to realize in Vermont, that it's one of the safest places you can be, that there have not been uh, significant episodes of people transmitting virus within the health care system itself, even though we do see cases within the health care system. So I think a lot more uh, Vermonters are going back to getting their regular medical care. I don't know about how that translates yet into other vaccine data. I haven't been tracking that as closely. It's much more the flu vaccine that we've been uh, reporting on here. Okay, thank you. Greg, the County Courier. Good morning, Governor. Good morning, Dr. Levine. Uh, Dr. while you're at the podium, a uh, quick question for you. Uh, in regard to the graph that you continue to show uh, with, a, with a spike last week, uh, at least some of those cases can be attributed to other dates. Why has your department not gone back through to identify what dates each of those cases should actually be attributed to and, and correct the graph so that we can better see the progress of the virus? Because the way the graph is constructed and the way we've been consistent with our data is to um, put the case on the day that it is reported. That is the key to understanding how that works. However, every day, even though that's how it looks on that graph, we get a clear accounting of what the date was that the test was actually performed. And so it doesn't hinder us from doing epidemiologic work. It just keeps us consistent in reporting apples to apples consistently for the whole whatever number of months we've been through already. I've just heard people that are a little concerned that it, it seems that, you know, especially being one week after Thanksgiving that it's a little deceptive, so I, I didn't know if maybe that'd be a better way to show it to the public. Yeah, no, that's a good thought, but I would, I would just point out that many of the cases would have been in days preceding that spike, which probably would have been too early for a Thanksgiving-related um, case. So it's, it's not misrepresenting the data in any major way. But I understand where you're coming uh, from. Governor, yeah, thank, thank you, Dr. Levine. Appreciate it. Um, Governor... Uh, I understand there's at least one school closure in Franklin County due to the virus. Can you give us an update uh, on that and, and any other school closures? And uh, is your administration still maintaining that there's no spread among primary school students or teachers? Um, I may ask uh, maybe Secretary French if he's on and give us an update on the, uh, the school in Franklin County. Um, by and large, I think we still are doing very well in our schools and not seeing uh, the number of outbreaks and so forth. So, uh, is Secretary French on the line? No. Okay. Okay. Hi, this is Deputy Secretary Boucher. Uh, we're not, I'm not aware of a school closure. It's possible that one of our schools has decided to go into a remote um, learning paradigm, but we can get back to you on that for certain. Sure, appreciate that. If that could be by the end of the day, I'd really appreciate it. Yes, Thank absolutely. You. Thanks for the time. Wilson, the AP. Hi, um, morning everybody. I have two questions. One, the first one is a two-part question, but hopefully it's quick. I can ask them both together. Um, Dr. Levine and Governor Scott, you both seem to be uh, almost saying that, hey, we have dodged the bullet on um, the Thanksgiving surge that you feared so much. I mean, can you address that a little more directly? Have we um, 
dodge that bullet? And Ian, the second part of that question is, do you anticipate making a, a similar call for the upcoming Christmas and New Year's holidays and whatever holidays people might be celebrating? Yeah. That's question one. The second one for Dr. Levine, how do you anticipate the rollout of the uh, vaccine across the state? Do you anticipate as more people get vaccinated, the number of positive cases that are being reported and fatalities will drop? Uh, conversely to that. And so those are my questions. Um, again, in terms of uh, Thanksgiving, uh, we know that we asked a lot of Vermonters, and, and it appears that they, uh, from just anecdotally and from my um, uh, moving around on that day myself, uh, it didn't seem as though there was much traffic on our, on our highways. And, uh, and, and the data thus far uh, shows uh, a positive result. So. Uh, we're just, uh, we just need a couple more days uh, to make sure that it is the case. Our seven-day rolling average has been okay. I mean, uh, again, it's still too high, uh, but, uh, but it was high uh, before Thanksgiving. That's why we put those measures into place. So uh, good news, uh, and, uh, and again, from my standpoint, uh, we just need a couple more days to, to be sure that, it's, uh, that it is the case. And, and the holidays later um, again we'll uh, we'll see what happens over the next few days but um, uh, but we're not seeing a dramatic drop I mean that's the point uh, and I'm not saying we're not going to consider any changes uh, for <clears throat> the uh, the ho upcoming holiday but we're still seeing high levels uh, and it, even though it, it it leveled off they're leveled off at a high rate so Again, what we did uh, helped. We just don't want to uh, exacerbate the situation and make it worse. So we'll, we'll pull all that together and make some determinations over the next week or so. And I have nothing further to answer that question with, but the second question that you asked regarding uh, what we will see in rates of death and things of that sort. So uh, I, I say this just to be completely candid and not to take away people's hope or anything of that sort, but let's look at the earliest group that's going to get the vaccine, people in long-term care. By the time they've gotten their second dose of vaccine and then had a few weeks go by to build up that immune response, it's going to be um, actually in February. Even though they'll have gotten their doses, uh, for earliest dose, potentially in, in December, many in January. Second dose, definitely in January. So we're going to talk early February before we even see an immune response uh, that we would want to be seeing at that level. So if I can channel Dr. Fauci, uh, Dr. Redfield from the CDC, they are all saying this is looking like a horrific winter in the United States. I'm not saying that for Vermont, but in the United States, when you look at the kinds of numbers that are happening every day that people might get numb to after a while, uh, those are not going to be impacted by a vaccine appearing on the scene at Christmas time. It's going to take till February, March, and beyond to really see the impact of that, and that's on this most vulnerable population I'm just talking about. Most of us who are in the more general population aren't even going to see the vaccine uh, till March, April, May kind of thing, with higher risk groups starting to see it in January and February. But again, for the impact on those groups, knowing it's a two-dose two vaccine and you need to build up immune response, it's going to be well into February or March before that happens. So I'm not taking away hope here. I'm just providing a reality context that the stark statistics on the TV of hospitalizations and deaths and cases aren't going to change like a, a snap of a finger because there's a vaccine on the market. But they are going to change, and the changes will occur after February more, more dramatically, we hope. Okay, I just, thank you very much, both of you. Yeah, I just want to add um, just so that we're all realistic here. Um, a lot of this depends on how much of the vaccine we receive. We don't have control of that. Uh, we've been told that it's going to be equitably uh, distributed throughout the states based on population. 
but we don't know what that supply is. So we may not get the doses uh, that uh, everyone thinks we are. And uh, we're still waiting for the approval of the second uh, company, Moderna, uh, and uh, that will have a, a positive effect on, on the supply as well. So a lot of it hinges on how much of the vaccine we are going to receive, and then, uh, but we're ready uh, again to vaccinate as soon as we receive it. But we don't have control over that aspect. Okay, again, thank you both. Pat, WCAS. Well, that was actually a perfect segue into my question, which was we've heard a lot, of course, about Pfizer's vaccine and the first wave of vaccinations coming from them. But of course, Moderna is inching towards FDA emergency use authorization as well. So when you look more broadly, when do you expect that Vermonters might see multiple options for a vaccine? Yeah, well, again, I think you laid it out uh, very well. Uh, it's, uh, it's, all, it's not in our hands here in Vermont. Uh, it's in the hands of uh, the FDA, uh, the advisory panel, uh, the CDC, and uh, but it looks good. I mean, they've uh, they've uh, shown uh, the uh, some of the trials have shown that they. I think Moderna might be 95 percent effective, which is great news. Uh, and uh, and so once that is approved, it's, it took some time for Pfizer to get to that point, uh, and then it just again uh, do the do the math as we move forward. So. Uh, hard to tell, uh, but uh, but I know everybody is working as quickly as possible uh, to to make sure that we have a safe vaccine to distribute or as safe as possible, and uh, and then keep track of uh, of all of this at the same time because it really is going to be important with all the different platforms, and there may be a third or fourth uh, manufacturer uh, coming to the forefront in the next month or two. So. Uh, we have to keep track of all that and what the different dose rates are and making sure you receive the same dose and so forth. So it's complicated, um, but uh, but we feel we are prepared and ready to go just as soon as we receive uh, those supplies from the federal government. Dr. Levine, did you have any insight on a possible timeline, though, for when um, you know we might get more vaccine after this first round from Pfizer? So when we might see... Um, the, you know, we'll call it the next round, however, that ship, however you want to term that shipment. Right. So with the Pfizer, we're, we're pretty certain, as certain as we can be from what we're being told, that we're going to get the same number of doses for at least the first three to four weeks each week, the same number of doses repeating. But Moderna is probably a week to two weeks behind. So that lag time, which is not very long, I mean, this is still a very rapid uh, sequencing here. Um, and Moderna, we, we believe we will get even more doses than what we have of Pfizer uh, in terms of what's ready to be deployed uh, when, when they get their authorization. So there will be not just a doubling of doses, uh, there'll probably be a little more than a doubling based on the fact that Moderna has a little more stockpiled at this point in time. And, uh, and I don't really know about anybody beyond Moderna. You know, the UVM uh, College of Medicine is involved in the AstraZeneca trials, and that's the one that nationally keeps getting named as one that could potentially get authorization next, but certainly not in 2020. So it would be uh, sometime after the new year. Got it. Thank you. Eric, the Times Argus. Yes, this is a question about uh, Vermont Alert. I see on the website that there's an option for those who uh, have alerts sent to their home or work phone. We know some in the state, especially older residents, don't have access to NC internet or a cell phone. So how would they go about signing up for these alerts? And once they are signed up, what does the alert look like? They're not going to be receiving a text message or yeah, Director for and is that? Yes, thank you. Um, so folks can sign up in a, a, a few uh, different ways. You can either go online, um, either at home or uh, uh, anywhere you have internet access um, and sign up on the website. You can download the Everbridge app on your cell phone. Um, and uh, of course, you can go anywhere where you have uh, access to service for that. Um, you can, when you sign up, you can receive notifications uh, on your home phone. 
Um, that is a, it's a, through a reverse dialing function that the uh, Vermont Alert system has, uh, in addition to text messages uh, and emails, um, and uh, as well as notifications on the Everbridge app. It's really up to you as a user how you want to receive those notifications and what types of notifications you want to receive in different modalities. Did I answer the question? Because I didn't. I wasn't. I was trying to hear most of it. I was having a hard time. Eric, you may need to hit star six again. We we're getting some feedback from your line. We could follow up with him if that's not the. We can do that. Yeah. Thank but you. I think from what I heard. Hold on. I'm back. I got muted there for a second. I don't know why. Um, so do they need internet access to be able to sign up? Is there a number they can call to sign up? Um, you, you really do need to have internet access to sign up um, only because uh, if you want to make changes to your notifications um, and uh, or you know somewhere down the line um, you would want to be able to log in and that login is dependent on a password that you uh, choose. Okay, thank you. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Governor, uh, just a follow up from earlier this week. Uh, on Tuesday, you noted the uh, good news from Attorney General T.J. Donovan, siding with your original transparency policy when it comes to police telling the public about crashes involving teenage drivers that killed Vermonters and other serious accidents. But you also noted the that opinion was breaking and you hadn't been brought up to speed. I'm guessing you've been briefed now. Um, and I'm told the temporary gag order that the Public Safety Commissioner imposed 12 weeks ago currently still is in effect this morning. It took less than 24 hours for the Commissioner to impose that, yet now we're on day four and still not reversed. I'm just wondering what you heard. We heard from the Commissioner the other day, what time is short enough, so what can you tell us, Governor, as to how to get this temporary gag order lifted for the public and yeah. when will that be any idea? Yeah, um, Mike, I have not uh, been briefed. Uh, there have been other areas that uh, have taken a, had a higher priority over the next, last couple of days. So uh, I will, uh, I will get, uh, I haven't been, have had no co correspondence with the Attorney General on this at all. So I'll, uh, I'll try and get up to speed and, uh, and get something to you, but uh, but I, I don't know I don't have any uh, any response at this point because I just I just don't have the answers. Okay, you might have something next week to uh, Tuesday or I'll, I'll do my best. You always do. I appreciate that. Thank you. Guy Chronicle of the Vermont State House. Page. All right, we'll move to Lisa Loomis, the Valley Reporter. Uh, is it my turn, Rebecca? It's Lisa from the Valley Reporter. Yes, go ahead, Lisa. Thank you. Secretary Smith explained that the contractor Maximus would be augmenting the state's contact tracing efforts. Is Maximus being paid with CARES funds? and has the state allocated or spent all of its care funded? If not, how much is left? They say you just went out of my pay grade on uh, how much is left uh, because it's uh, there. I'll probably ask uh, Secretary Young to help me out, the Secretary of Administration to help me out. Uh, this will not be uh, CARES Act uh, money that uh, We'll do, be doing a contract extension on this. As you rightly pointed out, the CARES Act money runs out on December 31st, and we will obviously be contact, contact tracing beyond uh, December 31st. So we will be using uh, general fund money in, in this regard to do that contract, contract extension for Maximus. Thank you. Secretary Young. Thank you. Um, 
We have, at this point in time, allocated all of our CARES Act or coronavirus relief funds uh, to programs and appropriations to departments and uh, outside entities. So right now, we are in the process of doing an accounting as to whether they've been able to spend all of their coronavirus relief funds on eligible projects before the end of the year. So that's what we call the reconciliation process. So as we do that, we do find that some money is freed up because the original receiver could not um, use it, and we've been going into the Joint Fiscal Committee over the last four weeks asking for that money to be reallocated to other programs or other uses as uh, we determine um, where there's still critical needs. So that's one way of saying um, we've pretty much spent it all, but as that that can't be spent uh, comes to light, we're reallocating it so we do not leave any money on the table at the end of the year. If I could uh, add to that, Secretary Young, and uh, maybe you can confirm, but we did go into the Joint Fiscal Committee uh, the other day with a proposal for about, uh, I think it was around $20 million. Uh, they approved uh, one piece of that. Uh, I think it was $2 million for the hazard pay uh, program that we, we could have used a little bit more money. Uh, that $2 million will fulfill uh, some of the, the need in that program that they established, um, but uh, they did not approve the uh, the economic relief, the added uh, 10 or $11 million in uh, economic relief for uh, some of the businesses that we wanted to add, and knowing that there's you know hundreds of millions of dollars worth of need, especially in the hospitality sector, we just thought give them an extra boost on top of the $150 million we just went through uh, last month. Um, but, um, but we're going to go back at that to uh, make another proposal to the Joint Fiscal Committee uh, to get that money out the door um, so that we can get it in the hands of those who, who need it at this point. There was also another piece that they didn't uh, move forward with, and it had to do with uh, agriculture going from dairy to non-dairy or vice versa. But um, if you could just confirm that for me, Secretary Young. Um, absolutely, Governor. The administration went into the Joint Fiscal Committee on Monday, having, um, or it was sometime earlier this week, uh, and asked for an additional uh, $1.75 million to go to the existing Agency of Agriculture grant program to um, move some of the money that was directed to the dairy uh, industry to the um, working land farm uh, because that program was undersubscribed. And the uh, Joint Fiscal Committee uh, denied that request. We also went in with $10 million to supplement the existing business um, grants, the economic recovery grants, and that money would have allowed the uh, pending applicants who are eligible to get on average about 5,000 more in the grants that are going out next week, and that was denied. Uh, those are the two major ones. And then they denied the request for housing pay of about $3.2 million for, um, as part of the human services request for the designated agency. So with that disapproval under the statutory process, we uh, had um, the opportunity to re revise and resubmit a proposal, which we did yesterday because the time, uh, the clock is ticking, and so we asked for uh, the agricultural grants to be revisited, and we um, increased our request for the economic relief grants uh, to 13.2 million. So as the process works, the Joint Fiscal Committee has five days to approve or disapprove that request. So we hope to have a decision on or before Tuesday so we know how much to include in the grants that we hope to put out next Wednesday or Thursday. Thank you all again, very much. Again, in fairness to the uh, Joint Fiscal Committee, I think that they were uh, maybe considering what Washington would do or not do over the next few days, and if they came to uh, agreement on some sort of relief package, that that might impact, which it, it, it may. Um, but they haven't moved, and we have to deal with reality at this point. So we want to make sure that we get this money out the door and in the hands of those who desperately need it to right now. Great. Aaron, BT Digger. Come on. I think 
question is, is a little bit about the review and a little bit of uh, um, Mike Smith. Um, is the state tracking how many people who are homeless have had COVID-19 in any way, um, you know, separately from, you know, as a the general population of face back? And are there any testing initiatives specifically targeted to that population? Do you have any information about how many people who are homeless have been tested? Aaron, that's the information I'm going to have to get back to you on how many people, uh, if we have information on how many people within that population have been tested um, and other information that you just asked. I just don't have that at my fingertips and whether we actually have that information, I'm just going to have to uh, get back to you on that. I, I apologize. I'll let Dr. Levine uh, answer that question for you. Yeah, if I'm hearing you correctly, um, if, if, if through contact tracing somebody's been identified but they may not have an address, a stable address, or um, be hard to find, certainly couldn't get a text on a cell phone, things of that sort. So, you know, we do have an extensive uh, district office network throughout every region of the state, and we have public health nurses who are working in those offices who are a real extension of our epidemiology branch, if you will, and they help with identification, they help with the public health aspects of having found a case in a certain setting and what the implications are for that setting, whether it be a, a place that houses people who are homeless or whether it's a school or what have you. So uh, there's certainly a lot of effort made to make sure that we can account for people who are identified that way, if, if that was the intent of your question. I, uh, yeah, yeah, um, thanks for, thanks for that. Sean, the Chester Telegraph. Uh, thank you. Um, with, with the emergency authorization of one or, or possibly two vaccines just around the corner, what, what's the state's messaging plan for ensuring that people take the shot, and, and when would that plan be publicly available? Yeah, it's, it's about acceptance of the vaccine. Is that what you're getting at, Sean? Yeah, I, I mean, basically to, to let people know about the vaccine and to answer their questions, and, and I guess to ensure that you get the maximum number of people taking it. Yeah, so there's an extensive messaging plan, and obviously you haven't seen it yet because we have to find out about the vaccine uh, before that can even happen. Uh, and there's still going to be some unknowns uh, if only the Pfizer vaccine is approved in the near future uh, because of the nature of the design of the studies that uh, Pfizer carried out. So um, obviously we do want to maximize uptake of the vaccine and reduce the amount of people who may be hesitant to get the vaccine. So we have to be very transparent, but we have to know exactly what we're talking about to do that. So um, while the communication plans are in place, the actual content is obviously the, the critical crux of the matter here. Do you, do you have an idea about how long that will be? You mean to when, to when you start to see it? Yeah. yeah, no, certainly during the, the course of the next several weeks. You know, I just want to keep in mind that um, it's going to be into January before the next priority group uh, becomes eligible to get vaccine based on, again, the numbers of doses coming into the state. And that priority group will cover a lot more people than are in the first group of uh, long-term care facilities and healthcare workers. Uh, so we'll certainly be prepared to meet the needs of that group. 
But in terms of the more general population who don't have a specific risk factor and, a, and may be very large in number, um, the same information will be pertinent to them, uh, but they won't actually need that information for a lot longer because they won't be getting their vaccine uh, until 2021, hopefully earlier in the year uh, before the spring, but we'll have to see. And Sean, uh, th it's, this isn't specific to the um, vaccines on the table right now, but our original interim vaccination plan submitted to the CDC, which is available on healthvermont.gov, does outline in section 12, the communications plan. It's, it's generalized and high level because the details weren't available when this was submitted, but it does lay out um, channels as well as you know, community partners and other steps that will all go into that com communication specific planning process. Yeah, I, I did read that. That's why I was asking the question about the, a more um, specific thing, but obviously that's coming. Thank you. And I'll just add that you know, by the time we get to that phase of things, the primary care practice community is going to be very heavily involved in this whole uh, vaccination effort. And when you come down to it, it's one thing for the state to say this or to say that, but people have usually access to primary care. And in this state, we have very high percentages of our population who have a primary care clinician. And it's obviously that trusted relationship and the shared decision making that goes on and those interactions that will be critical to the uh, average Vermonter. Um, though I'd love to say that whatever we put out as a health department and as uh, a state would be as critical information to them. Uh, obviously, everybody wants to hear from their doctor uh, or nurse practitioner and, and understand exactly their feelings about it and how they can individualize the advice to the individual person based on what they know about them. Thank you. Peter Hirschfeld, BPR. Peter, BPR. All right, we'll go to Stuart, NBC5. Good afternoon. Uh, Stuart, are you still there? Try that again, Stuart. Okay. Uh, following up on Tim McQuiston's question, specific to skiing, we've, now that the season's underway, had a few emails. Um, and I'll paraphrase one from Stowe. Uh, I know for sure the parking lot at Stowe is filled with out-of-state plates and there is a zero chance that all of these people have quarantined. Uh, we've had people from Okemo send messages of similar concern. So the question is what can the health department do to ensure folks arriving from out-of-state follow the, the quarantine and, and testing protocols? Yeah, again, not a perfect system, but I'll ask uh, Commissioner Sherling or uh, Secretary Curley, uh, maybe they could uh, provide some some details. Sure, uh, happy to show this is Secretary Curley. Um, the ski areas are working very hard to be sure to educate folks on the need to, to carry out a quarantine before they come to Vermont to the slope. Um, we have signs, as the governor has talked about, on the interstate, um, as they're exiting the interstate. The ski areas have a lot of on it. The Department of Tourism and Marketing is spending a great deal of time getting that message out to make sure people know before they go. So I hope and I feel that if people really are willing to carry out a quarantine with a little planning, they're, they're willing to make the sacrifice. So um, unless we have specific information to prove that somebody has not, then it's hard to, to go after folks. Um, and honestly, we uh, we feel like everybody's working together to make it work, and we're hopeful that, that folks are complying. As far as further enforcement, I would certainly have to um, look at uh, Commissioner Sherling to help on that. Could, could I, mm -hmm. Let me just add, uh, before uh, Commissioner Sherling weighs in on this, 
I, I just, you know, I'm not being naive, um, but at the same time, I don't believe that we uh, should jump to the conclusion just because we see uh, an out-of-state plate in a parking lot that they haven't quarantined. Many have uh, second homes here in Vermont. So, some have uh, have moved here and stayed here uh, because uh, they uh, they want to enjoy their home. It's a safe place, and uh, they can work remotely. So we have many people in that category. As well, we keep watching the data. Uh, that's really important to us, as we've said before. And I'm not seeing on the uh, on the reports I receive on a, on a daily basis. I'm not seeing uh, that. I haven't seen hardly any uh, out of state um, uh, mentions of uh, those who are positive. So, you know, I, in, in one hand, we want people to adhere to the, the guidance. Uh, but if we're not seeing a problem at, at this point in time either if it isn't being adhered to. So we'll continue to monitor this. Uh, we know the Skirias uh, want to uh, to uh, make sure that they're safe uh, because it's part of you know their attraction as well. Uh, they don't want an outbreak uh, on their uh, on their mountain or at their facility. So, uh, Commissioner Sherling, anything to add to that? Very little, Governor. I think uh, you and Secretary Curley covered most of it. I would just add one piece, which is that if, uh, if folks have uh, information that indicates noncompliance and then uh, with the guidance and the details around that, if you could send it to either Commerce or Public Safety, it would help us to um, refine the educational posture that has worked uh, quite well so far. Okay, uh, and just a question for you, Governor. Uh, what do you think of the Texas lawsuit uh, challenging the four other states and the fact that now more than 100 Republicans in Congress have signed on to it? Yeah, um, I think it's bizarre in a lot of respects. I think that uh, we need to move on. Uh, I think it's amazing to me that 17 attorney generals have signed on to this. Uh, so, um, again, I don't know. Uh, what the intent is here, uh, but these are, you know, these are Republican Republican governors and Republican lieutenant governors and Republican secretary of states have signed off on the elections in their states, said that they they certified them, uh, and for uh, this lawsuit to come about and try and challenge some of those states, is just uh, unnecessary, and uh, you know a bit pathetic in some respects. So we need to move on. They say they're scared of the president. That doesn't which, include which you, one? The Republicans signing off are oh. scared of the wrath of the president. Well, that does not include you, I gather. No, it doesn't include me, and nor does it include many other uh, governor, Republican governors throughout the country. Um, again, uh, you know, we need to do what's right. Uh, we don't need to harm the institution any more than it has already been harmed. So. We need to move on uh, and uh, and look forward to, to brighter days ahead and trying to really focus on, you know, the con common en enemy here, as I said in my remarks, is the virus. And it seems as though others are trying to take our focus away from that when we need to be focused on this. I mean, when you have 3,000 deaths a day, uh, we're, we're getting to the point where we're going to exceed the 300,000 mark. I mean, this is disturbing uh, that that we take our focus away from from what, what really is the problem here so again I uh, I'm hoping uh, the uh, the Supreme Court will react uh, in a, an appropriate way I'm sure they will and uh, then be done with it and, and move on thank you and I understand Peter Hirschfeld was disconnected but should be back on the line Peter Apologies for the miscue. Governor, uh, the legislature is beginning to draft a framework that acknowledges the impact of the pandemic on town meeting day. And it looks like they're um, going to put together a bill that would give uh, towns and districts the ability to change the date of town meeting day if they want, um, and also give them the latitude, though not require them, to adopt a mail in voting for town meeting day ballot measures. Um, is that consistent with what you are looking for? Um, or are you looking for uh, mandatory universal mail-in balloting for town meeting day? Yeah, 
Well, I, again, my preference is to move forward with a, with a mandatory balloting uh, proposal uh, because it worked so well in the general election. Uh, but uh, we're at the, the table with the legislature at this point in time. We just, you know, we can sense, you can see, uh, we're in a uh, tougher position today uh, than we were uh, before the, the November election. And uh, so we know we, we need to take action uh, in terms of uh, town meeting day in March. So we're at the table with them. Uh, we'll come up with a solution, I believe, that everyone can can accept and uh, and again uh, trying to to do what we can to protect uh, the process uh, as well as uh, protect our constituents and uh, and I think that we all have that in mind so I, I look forward to something we can all agree to and uh, I can sign uh, very early on because they, they need to know this uh, the towns and municipalities need to know this uh, or have this uh, in uh, in law before the end of the end of January so time is of the essence and why not why, why not give towns uh, the latitude to decide whether mail-in voting is right for them or not well, I just I think I just said that we'll we're working through that again I I, I believe uh, we just came off of a, a general election uh, where we had the highest turnout in history uh, and uh, and it seemed to work fairly well and why not continue with that process? Thank you. Austin, the Burlington Free Press. Hi, uh, I believe my questions are for Secretary Smith, and I do want to apologize in advance. I've had some connectivity issues on my end, so I may have missed uh, a couple things along the way. But my questions have to do with the uh, emerging, emergency staffing help for uh, skilled nursing facilities and long-term care facilities. And regarding the uh, TLC contracts, the, the 40 staff you mentioned, uh, how much of the demand does that help fill and at what cost is that contract for the state? The uh, contract is $1.4 million and it should help us because it doesn't, it does the demand doesn't help happen all at once. Uh, I mean, it happens all at once for a very brief short, uh, period of time before we can sort of stabilize uh, staffing on a longer term basis. And as I mentioned, our area where it is the most critical need is the 24 to 48 hour period. And in those institutions that have outbreaks where there may be death involved uh, because uh, of the attention that has to be uh, paid to uh, the various patients that are in critical need. So uh, the the 40 um, staff RNs, LPNs, LNAs, and unlicensed caregivers uh, support staff, I, I th think will be sufficient. Plus, as you as you've pointed out, we're calling for volunteers as well, uh, both paid and and uh, and volunteers uh, with a website, and I'm going to. Uh, shamelessly promote this website here because we do need the volunteers uh, to be helping out in long-term care facilities. COVIDstaffing.vermont.gov. And with that call to action effort, I mean, what sort of numbers are you hoping to achieve with that? We, we haven't put any numbers on it. Uh, we just want, you know, s some of the staffing will be for relief uh, because as I said in the beginning remarks, We've had heroic efforts by multiple people, including existing staff within those facilities working multiple shifts. Um, we've had heroic efforts from volunteers already. I've heard of, uh, you know, vice presidents of organizations, nurses, uh, coming in and helping out. Our UVMMC has been uh, critical in helping out in this need. So, you know, we, we don't put a number on it, but I think with the 40, uh, additional staff that we will have through this contract, I think we will meet the needs of those critical periods that we need. Thank you very much. All right, and uh, I appreciate all the reporters help in keeping to the two, one to two questions. Just a quick time check for reference, it's 1245, and there are still 11 left in the queue. Ann Wallace Allen. Hi, thanks. I only have one question. Governor 
You have spoken before about the timing of some of the federal and state programs that are en effectively ending at the end of the year, which is going to stop some of the relief that has been directed at Vermonters who've lost their jobs as a result of the pandemic. I mean, one of them is the uh, state unemployment insurance, where people were naturally timing out and there's no extension, no more extensions available for them. Um, has the administration been able to come up with any data on how people are going to be affected or how many people are going to be affected by this? And I'm also wondering, um, you know, you've spoken before Ahab, about how there's no more state support for them. The Department of Labor has said they can't extend the insurance benefits without another stimulus package. Is there, is there any uh, plan in place to determine who is going to need this help to get through the winter, you know, the early winter months? Because even if a stimulus package passes, in, you know, in the very beginning of the winter, it'll take a while for this money to get to people. Um, is um, there any provision for the people? I, I noticed that there wasn't, in the, in the latest proposal in front of the Joint Fiscal Committee, there wasn't anything set aside specifically for that. Yeah, my, my biggest concern at this point is UI or PUA. Um, we believe uh, there's anywhere from 15 to 20,000 uh, Vermonters who will be impacted um, by lack of action on the part of Congress. Um, that equates to up to um, $10 million every single week. Uh, and we can't use the, uh, we can't use the um, unemployment um, trust fund uh, to to uh, to do anything with. I mean, we have resources within the. Uh, that's what's uh, frustrating in some respects because we have the unemployment trust fund, and it's it's in pretty good shape. I mean, we we started out with uh, a half a billion dollars in there, a little over five hundred million. We're, we have about two hundred and fifty million million in there now. So we have the resources, but we can't use it. Our hands are tied. Um, so. All they would have to do, uh, Congress would have to do, if they did nothing else, if they would just extend uh, the unemployment and POA and so forth, we would have the resources needed uh, to, to fulfill the need. Uh, so that's, from my standpoint, that's the highest priority at this point in time. The rest we can catch up on. So uh, I believe, I still believe, I, I spoke with some other governors last night on a, uh, a conference call. Um, they've been uh, going to their uh, congress congressional delegation, and these are folks who, on both sides of the aisle, and uh, and they believe uh, they believe when speaking uh, to again members of both sides of the aisle that there could be uh, something that would take place before the end of the year, but but again, um, we uh, I know I, I I know how dire uh, the need is here uh, in this state for those who are on unemployment right now. And that's why we need their help. We need them to take action. We need them to do it now. Thanks, but there's no uh, provision for reallocating some of the state money that has come back. You said there's $24 million to yeah, that, that I, Again, as I said, uh, Ann, you, you know, that's it's $10 million a week. Um, we would burn through that in about a week and a half. Uh, with what's left, that's that's not enough. That's not going to fix the problem. All right, thanks. And and plus, uh, as well, I will say, we can't we can't in some respects we can't utilize that because we have to ex expend that uh, by twelve thirty one, and these programs are running out uh, about the same time. So it's it it wouldn't be we we can't utilize that funding after the first. Um, good point. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my question is about uh, the letter and the intent of the multi-household gathering restrictions um, as it applies to extended families and students. We've heard from a school administrator around here who's understanding uh, of the of the restrictions is that extended family members, for instance, grandparents, can provide transportation and after school child care, um, and who have been doing so can continue to do so. But on weekends or, for instance, on Thanksgiving, the same grandparents shouldn't and couldn't interact with the family. Is that understanding accurate? Um, and, uh, and if so, how are schools supposed to supervise and educate their families and students on, on that level of nuance? Yeah. What uh, 
What letter are you referring to? Uh, it's a, a letter that we received from a school administrator that, uh, whose understanding is that grandparents, for instance, could drive a kid to school, um, but the same grandparents couldn't interact with the kids uh, on the weekend or during a holiday. Or... Yeah, um, again, I'm not sure if I get the full flavor. Um, I'm looking for Dr. Levine or maybe Commissioner Sherwin. Lindsay. Yeah. It's, I, I think it's actually a guidance piece for the agency. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm going to let uh, Deputy Secretary Boucher answer this because it appears that it might come from the Agency of Education. I believe so. Thank you, Governor. I, I believe this might be referring to a piece of our guidance that recommended, um, again, in keeping with the uh, goal of of not mixing up households that routinely were not interacting with one another, um, that that LEAs, local education agencies, build that question into their usual screening process. So I don't believe the intent of that was to, it was really to um, ensure that households that were not already um, interacting very um, regularly, such as the case with, um, we've heard from some families where grandparents are regular caregivers of children. My, my understanding is that was not the intention of, of that guidance. Um, so, so if there was a pre-existing arrangement for extended family to care for students um, that uh, was in place before uh, the application of household restrictions, that could continue and that interaction would be allowed outside of the context of the after school care. Well, we actually left, you know, we, I think that was the tacit understanding because it really is about um, social gatherings that do not typically occur. Um, so we didn't speak directly to that issue. That's for certain in the AOE guidance, um, but we could certainly revisit that and, and see if there needs to be some clarification on that. I think Secretary Curley can offer a little bit more as well. Secretary, Secretary Curley, do you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, I, I think that what we're getting at is um, we have, have permitted multiple households to get together where it relates to child care or health care or it's the need as we think about. But what we've asked is for multiple households not to gather outside of the necessary care um, related areas uh, right now because uh, so if you think of social gatherings. And, and this is our, our ask of them is we understand that sometimes you need to have a carpool or you have childcare, but you don't need to get together on the weekend for a family dinner, a, a family friend dinner, so to speak. Right now is not the right time for that. Okay, I guess that muddies the water, but I'll, I'll take it. For <laughs> let me <laughs> let me try to help you a little more. I think what you're asking is is you know perhaps when when a student has been with a grandparent for childcare purposes, um, so that the parent could go to work, for example, the child yes. um, is permitted to do that and and still be in school. But what they shouldn't be doing is making extra get-togethers happen, for example, in the evening or on a weekend, where it's truly for social purposes and not for the care of a child um, specifically or related to health. Is that helpful? Uh, I, it, it is clear to me now. So a grandparent can drive a student on Friday but can't uh, come over for lunch on Saturday. Correct. Thank you. It really does come down to that want and need, and, and it's you know it's a tough choice to make. But uh, when you think about bringing multiple families together for a social um, get together, dinner, and so forth, it's not uh, you know driving someone to school. It's getting together in, in a larger, much larger group in a social setting uh, without masks and so forth, and and that's where the spread uh, seems to take place, or it has been in the past. So. That's what we're trying to prevent, but uh, 
but I understand how murky and muddy that might seem and counterintuitive that might be. We'll go to Andrea at seven days. Hi there. Um, I, this question is for Secretary Smith, I believe. Um, I see on the COVID staffing site that there are some, there are um, open applications for these um, TLC staffing um, positions. Does TLC have um, staffers on hand right now who can activate immediately um, or are they still in the hiring process for those positions? They have 20 right now they can activate immediately. Um, we are hiring some more, but we expect that to be up by next week. And um, do you expect those, those 20 to, um, to like, how immediately <laughs> uh, will those 20 be, be done at the home? Well, I'm hoping when I say immediately, as soon as they're needed in uh, various homes. Okay, and do you anticipate that there is current need or um, that that will be, uh, you know, within the next few days? Yeah, I, I think there's always some need and, you know, those needs have been handled so far through UVMMC, the Home Health uh, Association, uh, volunteers and others. Uh, but we need to get these uh, paid staffers into these facilities. Uh, into some of these facilities as quick as possible when we see these outbreaks. And again, these what I'm talking about are very specific time periods within an outbreak. Once the outbreak, after the initial outbreak, staff seems to stabilize in this in this environment. So far, staff seems to stabilize in not, this uh, this environment. What we need is sort of a, an immediate. Um, uh, ability to get people in there within the 24 48 hour period and that is what we're doing right now so we have staff that can do that I don't know what what the if if we're going to be deploying those immediately or waiting to see if there is uh, needs in the next few days I, I just you know it, this is done almost nightly in terms of Dale looking around and seeing what the staffing needs are in these facilities that have had outbreaks. Okay, um, great, thank you. Avery, WCAX. My question is for Dr. Levine. Moderna has just announced that it is starting trials for its vaccine on adolescents. What could having an effective vaccine for adolescents mean for stopping the spread of COVID-19? That's a great question. The adolescent population we kind of regard as like the adult population in terms of their ability to uh, be able to transmit the virus. Much different than the much younger pediatric population that we've been emphasizing all along in this sort of K through six age range where it's much less likely that uh, they will be impacted by the virus or be able to transmit the virus. Um, so I think adolescence is a really critical time uh, and we would love to have a vaccine that adolescents were eligible for uh, and would be efficacious and safe in that population. You may know that in the Pfizer uh, vote that was taken um, by those on the panel, the only couple of uh, uh, reluctant votes were because of the age cutoff at 16 or 17, because those individuals felt that that age range hadn't been uh, amply examined in that study. Uh, but, uh, and I think the cutoff when it gets announced will be age 16. Um, for getting that vaccine. So if Moderna is doing more work in that arena, that will be welcomed. Thank you. Greg, the Bennington Banner. Thank you. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, you might be familiar with the story about the town of Stanford, first reported by Vermont Public Radio, detailing the town held an in-person public Christmas tree lighting that members of the select board said during in-person meeting at which they were unmasked that they regard the state's COVID-19 regulations as violating 
their constitutional rights. So my question is, what's your message to residents of Stanford who are concerned about their health and safety given these actions? And what's your message to the Vermonters and Stanford or elsewhere who do see these emergency orders as an infringement of their rights? Thank you. Well, again, um, to reinforce all the things that I said in my remarks and what we've been saying over the last nine months hold true. Uh, these measures do work. Uh, they have been working for Vermont, and I get how uh, difficult this is uh, for some. But putting a mask on uh, to, to, to prevent the spread is, is altruistic. If you don't want to do it for yourself, do it for someone else. Do it for your, for your loved ones. Um, it's just not that much to ask. When you think about sacrifices that have been made uh, for many, uh, especially you, know, you think about the greatest generation and what they had to, to go through uh, during World War II and, and the others who have served in, in public service, the sacrifices they made for us. This is, this is just a simple ask that is effective and will get us through this. So. Um, I, um, I, I appreciate uh, their, their stance, their position. I just don't agree with it. All right. And as for residents of Stanford who are concerned about this, I mean, do you have any message for them? Or are, have you been in contact with, uh, with folks in Stanford to um, uh, the, there's a way to sort of resolve things or do some more education? Or um, Again, uh, just adhere to the guidance that we've been laying out, you know, wear a mask. Stay okay. uh, physically separated. Don't gather in uh, in groups. Uh, and if you're sick, don't go to work. Um, you can you can uh, take that into your own hands. You don't need uh, public officials uh, to tell you what or what to do or what not to do uh, in that regard. But you know, it's just again common sense from my standpoint. Thank you very much, Governor. Thank you, Steve. Any KTV? Hello. No. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? You, you can hear me. I can. Great, thanks. Uh, one for the doctor and one for the governor, if I may. Um, uh, doctor, uh, I, I, I wanted to thank Ben Truman uh, for getting those uh, lab numbers about the PCR to me uh, so quickly. Uh, and, and efficiently, I'm, I'm sure you guys are, you know, up to your up to your necks and how busy you are. And I wanted to, to thank you guys for getting that data to me. And uh, but uh, uh, from what I understand, uh, the PCR, the lab uh, PCR numbers that we're using are between 32 and 37, from what I could see. And uh, no studies have shown that there is any infectious virus in asymptomatic patients or in tests using over 30 cycles. So if Vermont is using, say, 33 uh, plus uh, if for uh, the PCR test, wouldn't that um, result in almost a 97% a uh, false positive rate uh, because of the exponential nature of the PCR numbers? So first of all, thank you for the thank you. Uh, our communications team will appreciate that. Uh, with regard to the numbers, um, you know, all I'm going to say in response is our testing strategy has served us well. We've identified and been able to contact trace cases. We have the best statistics in the country. If your theory is correct, which again, uh, I'm not confirming that it is because uh, I don't believe it's universally subscribed to, but if it were correct and we were somewhat overestimating, um, it has paid off. And I would rather not get into a controversy about a person who may have some mild symptoms and had virus detected but it was at a higher um, cycle threshold value, uh, that's still a person who could transmit virus to somebody else, as far as I'm concerned. And I would much rather approach it from that standpoint than worry if that person just had inactive virus in their nose or 
copies that were too few to detect on a very, very sensitive assay and leave it at that because uh, th it's been a successful strategy and um, we're not only using the machine you just referred to, that's one of the platforms in the health department's armamentarium, but again, you know, across platforms, whether you're, st you're talking about Boston, the Mayo Clinic, or the UVM lab, uh, there's a whole array of lab tests being done with various cycle thresholds. And again, we seem to be at finding the, the, the virus when we need to and acting appropriately. And I don't believe we're missing it in any regard and hence uh, letting a lot of cases be out there that could be spread to other people and cause them harm uh, because it just doesn't bear out in the data. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Uh, Governor, um, you just mentioned the Supreme Court lawsuit uh, it is being bizarre. Uh, it is, would you consider it bizarre for a handful of states to disregard their own state laws and their state constitution uh, to change election laws at the last minute without authority from the legislature as the law proscribes? Uh, to disenfranchise uh, all the states that have that do follow the law and did things correctly. I, th I think it's bizarre for one state to sue another state over their own laws. I think that's what's bizarre, uh, and and I think that that's overreach. I mean, that's what you know. As a Republican, I believe in states' rights, individual rights, states' rights, and uh, and I just I, I just I just find that bizarre that that. Others would think that they should have an effect on, on another state, that they can sue another state to change the way it's changed their laws. And these are, again, these are, these are governors who have certified their results. They, they have found no reason. They, they found nothing that would, would, would impact uh, their decision to, to certify the results. So you're calling into question the governor, maybe the lieutenant governor, the secretary of state, or even their attorney general, maybe. Um, but certainly, you're calling into question their integrity, that they didn't sign uh, their certification of uh, their election. And that's what I find so bizarre. But if the election, if the election uh, did not follow their prescribed laws. But, the, but they signed off on it, Steve. These, these governors in yes. those states signed off on it. They, they swore an yes, oath to the Constitution. They signed it. They said these, these, w these did go through uh, in accordance to law. Well, I guess we'll let the, uh, we'll let the Supreme Court sort this one out. And, um, I hope they don't take very long in doing so. But I, yes, I, I believe that they need to weigh in. Uh, as they have in every other state, they, they need to bring some. They should bring some evidence. Is what they should do, um, which well, we haven't have you, seen. Have you been watching? Have you? Been I haven't watching been watching. Hearing? I haven't been watching anything uh, that uh, that shows me uh, that there's been any mass type of fraud. I mean, you, think about it. You'd have to have the the governor, the secretary of state, and others in on the fraud, right? I mean, for there to be this of, of this. Mass this wide scale um, um, situation. I, I just I just can't. With electronics, not necessarily. Maybe we should go to Canada, where we have a, you know, where they have a direct paper trail, and then there wouldn't be any questions. The Canadians seem to have this worked out. Perhaps the U.S. could uh, follow their example. Uh, good point, uh, Steve. And in, in this state, we did we do have uh, paper ballots. And uh, we can go back through them, and many other states do as well. And they have been certified. Even in some of the states that have been questioning, uh, they have paper ballots and have certified the results. All right, we're yeah, going to move the signatures to... in the envelope. We're gonna well, move... thank you, Governor, and thank you, Doctor. We move to Tom at the Vermont Standard. Tom, Vermont Standard. Uh, So thanks very much. 
Go ahead, Tom. Okay, uh, all of my questions have been addressed for today, so I just want to thank you, Governor. Oh. Well, thank you very much. And we're finally getting you on the line, so that's uh, that's good news. Yeah. We're making progress. Yeah, yeah, well, I've been, I've been hanging in there, uh, trying to hang in there the last couple of weeks, but uh, I'm here today, and uh, we have some questions on Tuesday. Thanks so much. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Mike, True North reports. Hello. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, Hi, thanks for taking my questions. Uh, Mike Belowski with True North Report. Um, I have an economic question. Uh, can you hear me okay? Sure, go ahead. Okay, great. Yep, over in New Hampshire, uh, Governor Chris Sununu is, I'm sorry, my son. Uh, Governor Sununu is proposing to reduce the rooms and meals tax to support their hotels and restaurants. Would you support such tax cuts here in Vermont for our own hotels and restaurants? Yeah. Well, I'm always in favor. Yeah, I'm always in favor of tax cuts, uh, Mike. Uh, but in this situation, I'm I'm just not familiar with what New Hampshire has done uh, with their uh, uh, CRF funds and so forth. But uh, we've we've uh, provided uh, a lot of relief. We know we need to provide more uh, for the hospitality sector. I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars more in aid is needed, and we're hoping uh, with the next uh, economic recovery uh, package that Congress will hopefully pass, uh, that there will be more funding available that we can distribute to them. We just took a different path, um, and, and I don't, again, I don't have uh, any knowledge of, of how much they've given uh, to their business sector out of the CRF funds they received, but I know that we've done a lot um, and want to do more and understand that there's more need. But, uh, but I'm not sure that that, uh, again, when you think about, we heard, we've heard uh, over the last few weeks, we've seen it, uh, that uh, the restaurants are struggling and they're not having the clientele uh, that they normally do. A lot of people aren't, aren't as, uh, don't feel uh, that they can go out to, to do that. Uh, and I respect that. Um, so they're struggling and, and some of, you know, because we're, we're so reliant on uh, on trade from other states. We're not having, and, and we haven't asked them to come, but we're not seeing uh, the the cross border support that we normally do, and we certainly don't have anyone from Canada coming in uh, either. So that impacts uh, the, the, the that sector, the hospitality sector, but I'm not sure that that's enough relief for them. So we've taken a different approach. Um, we've uh, given them a grants. Uh, directly, and uh, and we've done a lot uh, to date, but we know we need to do more in the future. Maybe you know I don't. I, I just I don't may. know the comparison, uh, Mike, between what New Hampshire has provided in CRF relief compared mm -hmm. to Vermont. Uh, um, and, and a quick follow-up, if I may, um, as businesses are forced to make huge cuts to their own operations and staff to survive during this economic downturn. Is the Vermont state government planning its own cuts to its programs and staff to mitigate costs during these tough times? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've taken uh, a number of steps ourselves. Uh, we're going to be presenting a budget uh, that will be balanced uh, based on reality uh, this, uh, in the next month. Um, so stay tuned. You know, we're, we'll do all we can uh, with what, what we have and, uh, and, and again, we want to focus on economic recovery because we know that uh, the businesses provide for the lifeblood of, of government. They provide the revenue uh, that we need uh, for the future. So we're going to work hand in hand and make sure that we uh, provide for the businesses so that they can survive and then thrive in the aftermath. All right. Well, okay. uh, well thanks as always. Thanks. Move to Robin, the Caledonian record. Robin, Caledonian record, star six to unmute. Okay, we'll move to Dana, local 22. Um, can you hear me? We can. Okay, so my question is regards to Christmas Eve. Some churches are planning on holding mass in person is this at all a concern? Well, obviously, um, 
anytime you have a mass gathering, uh, and I don't mean that in the, uh, the uh, religious sense, but anytime you have people getting together in a gathering, it's of concern to us uh, without the proper protocols, you know, making sure you're distancing, making sure you, uh, you uh, are, are wearing a mask and so forth. Um, we have not, uh, again, uh, we've asked the churches to, to limit the, their gatherings and use the safety protocols in place uh, based on the occupancy uh, rate in the, uh, in the facility. So, uh, again, we, we provided that guidance, and hopefully they'll adhere to that. And find other creative ways um, to, uh, um, to, uh, to get, get together. And uh, it's an important holiday for many. So um, it's an important religious holiday at that. So um, we understand uh, the need. Uh, but hopefully they can get creative and do it in a, in a safe way uh, so they can, uh, they can keep their uh, constituency uh, safe as well. Thank you. Guy Page. Guy. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much, Governor. Uh, question about guest certificates. Uh, of the 93 Vermonters uh, that is in the localities, how many, or even roughly what percentage, list COVID as the primary cause of death, and what roughly what percentage of this COVID as a contributing factor? Yeah, hey, I, don't, I don't have the answer to that, Guy. Um, be happy to, to try and figure Is that out. But I, don't, I don't have it at my disposal. Is, is the commissioner on the line? He, he is right here. The commissioner of health is right here. But he, I don't think he has it at his fingertips. We can, we can provide that to you, though. We'll, we'll go back through it. If you, for the future, if you have any of those specific areas where you'd like to have numbers of that nature, just just send us a text or, or send us an email, and we'll try and get that beforehand so that we're prepared uh, when we have the press conferences. Yes, Governor, I, I did, uh, and uh, they weren't able to come up with exact numbers. I guess I'm looking more for a, a, a general sense of wh where the balance falls on that. Is it... You know, Again, mostly primary cause of death. I I, do, uh, I don't. There, I haven't looked through the death certificates myself, guy. So I, I just don't know. Okay. But we'll be happy to take a look. Okay. Thank you. That's it. All right. Thank you very much, and we'll see you again on Tuesday. Uh,